I want to welcome back uh, Ellis and Kerry from a vacation. And uh, did you notice he introduced himself? We forgot who he was. He's just being away for the week. But thank you, and uh, God bless you. And we're headed out on, on mission together um, this afternoon or later this evening. Uh, so we've got a team of 26 going from New Hope, 20 from my old church, Holland Road. Uh, we're going to be uh, there in Wales. And uh, there's, there's about 30 pastors and church leaders who are waiting for us. And we've got an incredible program lined up. We're sort of doing multiple events in the evening. Evenings, lots of community action projects. My wife Louise has led uh, years and years of uh, a different community project each year that is kind of transformational. And uh, we're going to be in the schools. Uh, and just please pray for us because you know travel is crazy right now. We want to we want to make sure we get all our bags in. And uh, there's the COVID outbreak in Wales. There always is. And so just uh, pray for us that God will bless us in a supernatural way. Can I have an amen for that, brother? Hey, I, I love. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your prayers. We, we really are counting on you. And you know, I love the beach trips. That's great. But I tell you, my family. I think we know that there's something about those mission trips that has been very transformational. It's the first time we're going without one of our kids. And so that's quite a depth of emotion for, for our own children. But I know they're praying for us as well. But I tell you, when you, when you take your kids on a mission trip, it, it changes their life. They're never the same uh, as a result of that. Hey, Alex Edwards is going to be preaching for us uh, next Sunday. So we're excited about that. He's got Psalm 34. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So... Um, and students, you know, make sure you bring all your friends along. But I know that's going to be an awesome time there. And, uh, and by the way, there's a tremendous partnership with our North Campus in the student ministry that's just kind of being uh, reestablished. Mike Stewart is leading our student ministry at the moment, and uh, he's an incredible leader. He's, a, he's actually a, a teacher with a staff of 100, a head teacher of a staff with, with 100, and he's just volunteering. Uh, and uh, already he's tripled the workforce in our student ministry in the last three weeks. Can we praise God for that? So we just, uh, that's really encouraging. So, um, and during the summer, we're going to carry on with, with Life Psalm. And on the week that we, we take a, a break as well, uh, later in the month, uh, John Avant, our former pastor, is going to be preaching for us. He's the one that established the South Campus, had an incredible ministry here at New Hope. And many of you will remember him. Perhaps most of you won't even know who he is, but I tell you, he's a phenomenal preacher. And you're going to love what he's got for us. Uh, and I'll tell you all about that, um, you know, nearer the time. And then after going through the Life Psalms, we're moving into sort of more revival psalms in the summer. On August the 14th, we're starting a new series called Dealing with Toxic People. How to deal with toxic people in your life. All of you are going like, oh yeah, I know some of them. And uh, make sure that you're not the toxic person, right? And so we'll talk all about that. So I know that's going to be an, 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 an impactful time. Uh, we're relaunching Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights have been great here at the South Campus, but we're going to call them What's Up Wednesdays. And uh, we're going re to have um, our meals coming back. Praise the Lord. We're going to get our dinners back. So I'm uh, really excited about that. I also want to thank you all for showing up at the prayer meeting because though there was a torrential thunderstorm right the way during uh, that evening last week on, on the Monday, we still had a tremendous crowd. And I tell you, more than anything, we sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit and people were really just noticeably affected by the presence of the Lord in the prayer time. So we've started this kind of fresh pattern of every so often doing one uh, on a Monday night, uh, gathering together a different location. We pray that God will, will bless us. And so finally, I want to say happy birthday to the USA. It's, it's July the 4th weekend. And, uh, and uh, you know, of course, July the 4th is all about kicking out the British. And so... <laughs> Louise just said rude, you know, so, uh, but no, it, it was a good thing. The, the establishment of the principle of self-determination is actually the heart of uh, peace and liberty in this world. And so uh, you're still allowed to set off the fireworks despite, despite kicking us all out. And, uh, uh, but uh, no, I used to have a lot of fun about that. Actually, I think we should have a little bit of fun because everything's got very furrowed brow over the weekend about how you're going to do this, how you're going to do that. Isn't the whole point of liberty that we're actually free to worship God and to rejoice? and to love each other, amen. And so uh, I, I think that having said that, what an awesome time we've had today already. Uh, but I do want to say happy birthday and I want to thank those that do. And Zeke alluded to this. I, I praise God for those who serve in the home. That's the foundation of our land, for those that serve in the church. And it ne never look down on anyone that's, that's volunteering or ministering or serving in the church. For those that serve in the community, the emergency services, the hospitals, the schools, and of course, especially lives on the line in the military. And I'm hearing that's increasingly 
a difficult role, I I increasingly so. Chaplains are being watched. You know, just to be a Christian in the military is a harder thing in these days. And we've, been, we've done a wonderful tribute to the armed service on Memorial Sunday. Rich Terry has done a great job for us, helping to understand what the different aspects of the, of the different days are. And so uh, with that same spirit in our hearts, we, we echo that and thank those who are serving and pray for those who are serving in our land and across the world these days. Um, the Bible warns us against getting too focused on special Sundays, and so we're selective about that. We try to be wise about that, but remember the most important thing about any Sunday is that we have the freedom to open the Word of God, and every believer surely is yearning for a word from the Lord today. Can I have an amen for that? Nonetheless, let us pray for our land. I want to thank Zeke and the band for that incredible offering, and Heidi, that was an awesome new song. Thank you so much for singing. Let's give it up for Heidi. She's just a faithful worshiper here. So let's turn, let's turn to Psalm 80, shall we, everyone? Psalm 80, 80. Really looking forward to this one today. I'll flick my pages open as well. Awesome. Psalm 80, we're calling this getting out of trouble. Who needs to get out of trouble? Oh, some of you put your hands up way too fast at that point there. So we're going to read the, the, the psalm, quite a number of verses, and then we're going to unpack them and see if there's a... A chorus that gets repeated, you may notice that in the psalm. So here we go, Psalm 80, verse 1. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Now we see covenant language here. This is the story of Israel. You transplanted a vine. So the vine is often a picture of Israel in relation to God. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. And the mountains were covered with its shade, and the mighty cedars with its branches. And that takes us towards Lebanon in our minds, doesn't it? Its branches reached as far as the sea. Almost certainly that's the Mediterranean. It shoots as far as the river, that's the Euphrates. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the field, field feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Isn't that a strange prayer to pray? It's almost like, Lord, we've lost you. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see, watch over this vine. The root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand, this is a verse surely about the Messiah Jesus. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we might be saved. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And we're going to pray. At the conclusion of this message, I'm going to invite you to pray for God to restore uh, the things that we are crying for in our hearts for our nation. This psalm clearly comes in tough times. The people are in deep trouble. In golf terms, Israel is deep in the woods and the ball is unplayable. In motor terms, the truck has crashed into the tree. In health terms, the body is very sick. The problem is spiritual and the answer is God. Only God can get Israel out of trouble. Only God can help us. Only God is sufficient. The answer is God. Do you get that? We need the Lord, my friends, more than anything else. Uh, we're going to miss one of my best friends in this, on this planet, Philip Duke, has been just a regular. Many of you have met Philip when he's come over for uh, uh, you know, uh, trips in the past. But um, Philip is a great man of God, led more people to Christ than any man I've, I've ever known. Many of you will know Richie Desio in our church, who led hundreds to Christ. Philip Duke has led thousands to Christ. He's like a, a, a Richie Desio uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. 
but Philip will um, gently come alongside people, and there was a season in his life when he would just say to people, you need God in your life. And once you've had a conversation spiritually about that, almost everybody agrees with that. I encourage you, use that line. If God gives that to you, just sell, say someone, you need God in your life. And I'm telling you something, we need God in our life. Now, one of the phrases or the words that's repeated the most in this passage is the word saved. The word is repeated four times, twice in the first three verses. That means it's really important. And have you noticed as well, it's the very last word in the psalm as well, that word saved. Now, where I come from, people joke about that word because that word can sound strange to the modern ear. We're almost embarrassed about saying that word, and it's a word that can be misunderstood. But let me tell you something. If you're drowning in the river, you need to be saved. And if you're stranded in outer space, you need someone to find you. If you're about to fall off a cliff into the sea, you need to be saved. And if we're in spiritual trouble, and if the circumstances are desperate, and if only God will do for a person or a family or a community or a nation, if only God can save in each situation, then we should pray along with the psalmist at the end of verse two, come and save us, Lord. Everyone here today at some stage needs saving. And if God has saved you, then I say glory, hallelujah for that. But I'm telling you, there's a verse of scripture that also reminds us that we need to be saved. And this, this is a, a psalm that's clearly about personal salvation, but it's also a psalm about a nation needing to be saved from itself as well. Let's look at some verses that emphasize this word saved that's so strong in Psalm 80. John 10 verse 9, Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be, what? Saved. saved. Acts 2, 40 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily. Those who are being what? Saved. saved. Hey, I praise God for the 60 baptisms that we've had in the last three months. Can we praise God for that, everyone? We're rejoicing. <laughs> we pray it will be the beginning. We pray that each story and each one who's been unashamed of Christ that stepped forward will be growing in their faith. We baptized six last week. We had four young men. There was also Pedro, who we baptized at the North Campus. And um, he, he had a great story. He called up the church office and said, uh, can you baptize me? And we said, sure. He's part of the Spanish ministry. And he said, the only problem is I've got one leg. Well, he was talking to Al Mead. And Al goes, I've got one leg as well. <laughs> and, and so we bapt and also Pedro is blind as well. So last week we saw him walk up the steps, helped by brothers and sisters. He was baptized, the church was filled with joy. But let me tell you, there's more. Elisa was baptized last week. We've seen Elisa struggling to walk around our North Campus during the daytimes like she was training. I mean, she, she clearly was very wobbly. She was just struggling to put one foot in front of the other. We found out about a story in the end. She'd been in a terrible car wreck and she was learning to walk all over again. In fact, before she learned to walk, she literally had to crawl. She had to teach herself to crawl. And then she started walking. And some days we'd been sort of walk, walking through our buildings and we would see Elisa just lying on the floor. Well, uh, we baptized her on Sunday, amen. And we saw, we saw her struggle up those steps. She's quite a young woman. And uh, God was glorified. I mean, the church was on their feet, just praising God, encouraging Elisa. Um, she was at the prayer meeting on Monday night, and we shared a little bit about that. And some of you who were there will, would have sensed the joy there. Anyway, when there's a great story like that, I, I was talking to a receptionist this week, and she knows that, that um, uh, I've invited her to, to the church. And so she said, how's church going? I said, you'll never, you'll never guess. We baptized six folks this Sunday. And let me tell you about Elisa's story. So I told her Elisa's story. I, I showed her a photograph that I'd taken. This receptionist starts weeping. I wish I could tell you I kind of baptized her in the creek straight after that, but I just know that God is on the case, and everyone that is obedient to the Lord is a testimony to affect others as well, amen. Can we praise God for testimonies, everybody? But we're still talking about this repeated theme in Psalm 80, to be saved. How do we get out of trouble? We need to be saved. Acts 4.12, salvation, notice that word again, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Did you notice? Must be saved. Acts 16, verse 31, and this is something that related to an entire family. And the Apostle Paul says to the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. 
1 Corinthians 15, 2 tells us that salvation is not just something that happened in the past, but it's for everyone in the room even today. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. So if you've been saved, if God has saved you, he's going to give you the power to keep on being saved and to be faithful and to walk in him. Anyone who is truly saved will be faithful and will, will persist in the word of God. Amen. Mark 13, 13, Jesus said, everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And so I suggest to you today on this uh, July, the, the fourth weekend the need for any country or people or group or family, the greatest need in every individual today is to be saved and to persevere in that saving and to testify to that saving so that others may be saved as well. Can I have an amen in agreement to that? So I'll say it again that the salvation here in Psalm 80 is personal salvation, but it's also about a nation being saved as well. Every individual here needs to be in a right, in a right relationship with God the problem is our natural disposition is to be selfish and to want to go our own way. We do it all the time. We're tempted to do that all the time. Uh, in fact, the Bible even tells us we're not able to save ourselves. We're incapable of saving ourselves. Faith is a gift from God. So we need the miracle of the new birth to come into our lives by the grace of God. But I'm telling you, by the, the grace of God, he convicts us of sin. He convinces us of Jesus, our Savior. And he gives us the power to turn to him in repentance and faith. And that leads to a new birth. And when we are born again, we want everybody else to know about it because it's the greatest thing that can ever happen to you. I call upon each one in this room, be born again, be saved. I know it sounds old fashioned, but I think we've already recognized that it's every bit as relevant as ever before. Can I call upon everyone today to be saved? Make sure you're saved. Do you get that? <laughs> Make sure that you're saved. Now, there's something about the whole people here in Psalm 80. In the old covenant, an entire people, the vine, were in a relationship with God. Problem is that the old people broke the old covenant, and that's why God sent Jesus. So the context here is of an entire nation in trouble. And from time to time, Israel found themselves in a position when God said, I'm not going to listen to your prayers anymore. The Bible warns us we should be considerate to our wives, otherwise it will hinder our prayers. The Bible warns us, we talked about this the other day, that if we won't forgive somebody else, God won't forgive us. And so sometimes it's like prayer is not answered on behalf of the, of the land. Now, America is not in the old covenant with God as Israel was. But haven't, be, haven't we been warned by prophets and preachers over the years that if America continues to do this, and if this happens in our land, and if that happens in our land, then we'll be in trouble? Well, guess what? What happened? Those things came into our nation. Truth has been twisted. Sin has been tolerated first and then celebrated. And then you're expected to ally to sinful behaviors. And we're paying the price. When you don't stick with God's plan, the consequences will follow and you'll be in deep trouble. Amen. It's the history of the world. Just, just read a little bit of history and you'll see that every nation that's ever done that has ended up in trouble. And so... Sometimes it feels like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. What is the answer to that? Well, I praise God that we have Jesus, our intercessor. We praise God for the new covenant. We don't somehow work America into an old covenant with God. The fact is that we have the gospel of Jesus Christ today. And when that gospel takes root in this land, wow, what a blessing that is. And I just thank God for each and every one of you. I thank God for the remnant. Try not to spend all your time looking at all the bad stuff. Try and focus on what God is doing. Try and celebrate those people who are coming to Christ and rejoice in that. I want to encourage us, in fact, in these days, that one of the greatest things you can do in this day is to share Jesus with somebody. And I know that's a hard thing to do. It's a challenging thing to do for any of us. Um, but I think one thing that you can do is invite somebody to something. I believe that we have a window that felt like it was closed for a couple of years that has opened. A door seems to be open. And I've been sharing with you 26 people I've Invited to church, only one of them had been attending church. Please don't begin by asking them which church they're going to. Most people are not going to church. 
and just invite them along to your church. If they are a committed member of another church, they'll tell you about that really quickly. Yeah, I promise you, they'll tell you that one. But I'm gonna encourage you to invite people because there's a window of kind of gospel openness in people's lives right now that I've not seen in a long, long time. In fact, it felt worse for many, many moons, many months. It felt like there was just a hardness. There was the, almost like an inability to, to hear. But we, ha we have been praying, haven't we, that God will open people's eyes? Haven't we been praying that we won't waste this crisis, but that through it, many people will turn to Christ? Well, I want to encourage you that this is a great time to be inviting people into the family of God. The time, I've been saying this for a while, but I think you agree with me, the era, and can we declare this, the era of the consumer church is over. The era of the celebrity pastor, the casual attender is over. It's simply unsustainable. It just doesn't work. Every Christian needs to be suited up with the armor of God, amen? I'm gonna encourage you, I, I know this is like the one thing that Christians have probably been the worst at the last 20 years is inviting people to church. That's probably been the worst, worst thing that Christians have, uh, Christians have done all kinds of stuff. They've tithed, they've been, uh, they've been faithful in their marriages, they've been praying, they've been in Bible studies, but inviting people to church, it's almost like, it's like, no, there's, there's like a, a disconnect. I'm telling you, just try it once. Invite somebody to church this week. Bring, say, hey, we've got a family group. We've got a family group social coming up. Uh, give, give me a wave if you've got a family group social coming up in the next two or three months. L lots of stuff going on, I'm sure. And so invite them along to that. You think of all the church events we've gone in. Invite them along to Wednesday night. Hey, we're doing this class. Just give it a try. Will you do that, my friend? Give me a wave if you're willing to participate in this invitation blitz. Okay, it's about, actually, that's pretty good for us. That's pretty, and for most churches, actually, that's, that's pretty good. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if people, if people's greatest need is to be saved, who's going to invite them to be saved? Oh, God's going to send a bunch of angels to do it, right? And God won't work a miracle if the miraculous is to be, first of all, worked in us through normal means. God, God frequently wants to work through, Spurgeon said this, through normal means first. Don't ask him to work that miracle if you're not willing to do what he tells us to do. Remember what Jesus said, go into all the world. We're not asking you to go to Wales this week, all right? We're not asking you to lose your baggage, though I don't receive that. But we're asking you just to go next door. And, and you're gonna come into contact with someone this week. Just slow down, keep it simple. But I'm telling you, they're not gonna be mad at you. They're gonna go, thank you. Thank you so much. Now I realize that if someone gets saved and they sit next to you in church, you're never gonna be in the same in church again. You're gonna listen to everything the pastor is like, don't say that pastor, ooh, I wouldn't go there, pastor, if I were you. You just have a totally different experience when you've got that unsafe person sat next to you. Give me a wave if you know what that feels like. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. And I, know, and I think sometimes we stay away from it because it's gonna upset the comfort of our lives. Amen. But I'm gonna encourage you to uh, believe that the most important thing that people in our country need today is to be saved. I thank God that he saved me. Took hold of that 14 year old kid, I'm telling you something, another year, two years could have gone by, my heart could have got hardened to the things of God. I could have got into all the habits that all my friends were getting into. And uh, that window can be, just be a brief window. I know Pastor Alex, you're always encouraging the students to invite their friends. It's, it's not impossible that when you graduate, and you don't see most, most of your friends um, again. It, it's, it's um, according to statistics, if they're not saved by then, they're not gonna get saved. Except of course, by the power of God, amen. He can save anybody at any time, at any age, amen. But uh, students, you've probably got the most potent opportunity in your lives to tell people about Jesus. And I'm telling you, I, I, wasn't, I didn't go through the school of training that said you've got to be nervous about telling your friends about Jesus. I got saved, and I was so thrilled with being saved that I just started telling my friends about Jesus. No one told me, you've got to be really awkward about this. And, you know, and we just would stop people in the classroom. We'd say things like, do you know you're going to hell? No, no, that's not usually the way you're supposed to begin, but that's how I got saved. Someone told me I was going to hell, so I was like, oh, I don't want to go to hell. I want to follow Jesus, and Jesus came to my life. It's the greatest thing ever. And so we would do that, and guess what? A lot of people got saved. And so... Do it as wisely and as well as you can, but I'm not even asking you to tell them the full gospel, just invite them to something. And you'll, you'll find that that relation gets stronger and what a difference that makes. And I know there are people here today, you've been invited by your friends, and uh, I, I pray that you'll feel a great welcome in this place. Okay, let's just, that, that's like the big picture of the Psalm. We need to be saved, amen? America needs salvation. How do we get salvation? We know the answer to that. It's not through 
so many things. It's not through this person, it's only through Jesus. The only way American can possibly be saved is through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Well, let's unpack the psalm a little bit more clearly here. First of all, God established the holy people. That's what the psalm is all about. You know, businesses will often say, um, established in 1886 or whatever. America, established in 1776. Well, the, the, the covenant is established. And you could go back to the promise given to Abraham uh, you could go back to, to uh, Moses, you can go back to, some would mention 1948, I believe that the actual nation of Israel is established here, clearly in verse 1, when God takes hold of the people, verse 8, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. So there's something about the exodus and entering the promised land. This covenant language is used to say that the nation was established, amen? Isn't that great when God establishes things? When God establishes it, it will last forever, amen? Secondly, Israel compromised the covenant. That's the background story here. That's the pattern of history that we get blessed by God, and then instead of staying close to God, we just enjoy the blessings. We enjoy the trappings, and then we forget about God, and we fall away from Him. Well, Israel compromised the covenant. Let's look what this looks like in verse 12. You've broken down its walls, so that all who pass by pick its grapes. Boars from the forest ravage it. And insects from the fields feed on it. What do we just read there? The walls are broken down. That reminds me of the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a burden and God worked it all out. And he goes back to Jerusalem. He sees that the walls are broken down. He says to everyone, say, we're in big trouble here. See, when the walls are broken down, that means that security is gone. And when security and law and order has disappeared, you don't have prosperity. Everything you begin, everything you build gets taken away from you. And we see that in many of our cities, we see that in actually in every community. In America today, we have an increase of law and order, violence. Violence leads to an impoverished society, ultimately. Behind the symptom of broken walls here, though, is spiritual disobedience. We call this apostasy. And there's a lot of that that's been going on. I'm telling you, friends, are we even looking at a kind of end time falling away in these days across the world? Millions of people have walked away from the family of God. These are serious times that we're in. Then I want to talk about the boars, uh, the wild boars. Um, don't often get to talk about boars in church, do you? So I'm going to seize this opportunity and talk about these creatures. Is that okay, everyone? Um, you know, boars are known to be pretty wild and dangerous and difficult. Uh, actually, when we first arrived here, we've been here a few weeks. And I think, Carl, you talked to me about this. And I saw in, in the local newspaper you know those days when you used to have a newspaper come to your home and open this picture. And there's this picture of this massive boar. It was a 3,000 pound wild boar. And it was like a mile from our home. I'm thinking, what kind of a country have we come to? <laughs> this, this wild boar. And so I did a little research from this, you know, as I'm a theological scholar. How about this? Feral swine are reported to live in all of Georgia's 159 counties, likely only trailing the massive feral swine populations in Texas and Florida. We're almost as bad as Texas and Florida when it comes to feral swine, I'm thinking. It makes you want to quote, quote the Grinch, you know, run for your lives. Anyway, the, the boar doesn't say Akuna Matata. He doesn't actually say that. He's not a friendly one. He's an unclean creature, and he creates havoc in the land and in this context can we surely apply this and I don't think it's stretching it too much to apply it to America today would you agree with me that wild boars are ravaging the land that sin is rampant and the devil has had a field day the walls have been broken down and those little insects are getting into every crevice as well boars have any interaction with humanity it tends to be a destructive force we have the wild boars of immorality the wild boars of addiction, you know, alcohol and drugs, we hear about fentanyl increasingly. Um, the wild boar of not even knowing that there's a right and wrong. What can I get away with? It's acceptable for, for me to hate or to murder. Lawlessness, violence, pornography as a gateway to hell, sexual immorality, the wild boars are running through America. And let me tell you this, friend, the wild boar doesn't care. The wild boar seeks to ruin, amen? And I know we do our very best to shelter ourselves from the destruction of that, but there comes a point when if, it, if the wild boars are running through your land, that has an effect upon you and it has an effect upon everybody somewhere along the way. And therefore, you know what the answer is? We need to be saved. 
We need to be faithful and persistent and to live like a saved person all of our days, not just to be saved and then hide away. We have to be saved. We have to be out on mission. We have to be suited up with the armor of God. Amen. And let me tell you something. The gospel is still the power of God for the salvation of anyone who believes. Amen. Tell me a place in this nation where the gospel cannot penetrate and save souls and transform a culture. The wild boars, the walls are broken down, the insects. This is the situation that Israel was in. And so what do we pray? Verse 14, return to us, God Almighty. Return to us. Return to us. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because God is here. God's in the heart of everyone who believes, amen. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, but he's actually in our hearts as well at the same time. That's something that's hard for our minds to understand, but it's a wonderful miracle. But why do we, why do we pray return to us? Well, really, return to us means we need God to move in our hearts so that we may return to him as well. That's the most important thing, surely. Return to us, God Almighty. Story goes, do you remember those... Um, old cars that we used to have like it's like one seat what do you call what do you call that i know there's a term for it like it's like there's no it's not one seat say it again bench, yeah. bench seat give me a wave if you know what i'm talking about a bench seat there you go i i don't even know the language i've only been here 17 years but anyway the story goes actually billy graham told this story that's how i remember it um but uh, the, the husband and the wife they used to drive along you know they're 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 they're, uh, they're newlyweds and she sat right next to him getting ready. I know you can't do that these days, but uh, you could do that in the old days, in the good old days, right? And so she would sort of get really, very close to him. Oh, this is so lovely. And he's driving along. Am I doing the right side of the car? I think I am. And she, he's driving along. And so she's, she's close. And then, and then one day she's like sat right on the other side and she goes, honey, how come we don't sit close like we used to sit when we drove along? And the husband goes, he goes like, well, I didn't move. Return to us, Lord. God says, I didn't move. You moved. And so when we pray, return to us, aren't we also saying in our praying, Lord, I'm returning to you. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Oh, Lord, I've, I've, I've missed you. Prayer. The word. Worship. Even just inviting somebody to church, Lord, I've missed you. I've missed the thrill of being on mission. I've been living for me. I've been surviving. I've been hiding in my Y2K capsule during the crazy time. Some of you all don't even know what that is. Psalm 80 verse 4. How long, Lord Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? Do you remember that time when David experienced a similar thing? He's like, ah, there's a problem with the country right now. Uh, what is it? What is it? There's something, something's not right. David's going, ah, I know this. Oh. God's not answering prayers. That's why we got so much trouble. And so David goes, goes to see this guy in Jerusalem. It's actually on, you kind of, as you're reading it, you don't, almost don't realize it, but he's on Temple Mount, where the temple, you know, where the side of the temple is today. And uh, it's just a threshing floor, which was, was like an important place where decisions were made. And he goes, uh, can, I, can I buy you a threshing floor? Feel like God wants to do something? The guy goes, um, you can have it for free. And David goes, no, 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 I, I'm not going to make a sacrifice that would cost nothing. So David buys the land. This turns out to be the future site of the temple. And then once he's done that, brings an offering there. The word says, and then prayer was answered on behalf of the land. So what would it take for your prayers to be answered? What hindrance could there be in your praying right now? What I do know is that if there's unconfessed sin in my life, I'm not praying right. Yeah? And God is gracious. He can take any prayer presented through in the name of Jesus. And at the right hand of God, Jesus can do anything with your very ordinary prayer. Amen. Just like a child draws a picture, you don't go, oh, what a terrible picture. And the kid goes, well, I'm only four. It's like, no, you don't do that. So, so when you present your prayer to God through Jesus at the right hand of God, he answers our prayers in a beautiful way. But what I do know is that Husbands, if we're harsh with our wives, it will hinder our prayers. If we've not forgiven someone, that's going to hinder our prayers. If there's unconfessed sin in our life, we're just like living for ourselves. And then we say, oh, by the way, God, can you get me out of trouble? It's like, that's not really right praying. Now, God may get you out of trouble. That's not right praying. Uh, what do we do in order for those prayers to be prayed? Surely the implication when we pray, restore us, God, verse 7, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Surely there's an implication that we're going back to him. 
return to us, Lord, we're returning to you. Now, you know that word save can sound old-fashioned. The word repent can sound old-fashioned as well. It's like repent, repent. It sounds like a weirdo kind of walking through, through the town with one, one of those signs. But can I tell you, that word repent is one of the best words you can ever hear. When John the Baptist began his ministry, do you know what he said? Repent. And I, I suggest John was kind of saying this. Hey, everybody, the gates of heaven are wide open to you. I know you've been missing it. I know you've been trying to find satisfaction everywhere else and getting stuff and, and living for yourself. But he said, the gates of heaven are wide open to the likes of you. Just turn around. That's what repent means. Turn around. Come through the gates. When Jesus begins his ministry, what's the first word that Jesus preaches, everybody? Jesus, was Jesus a weirdo? No, no, no. He's the son of God. He's the greatest person who ever lived. What's the word that Jesus used? Repent. Isn't that interesting of Satan to, to, to make a situation so only weirdos ever use the word? But I'm telling you, it's the most normal thing that spiritual people can ever understand. Repent means turn around, return to the Lord. What is it to return? Return to us, God. We return to him as well. Amen. We say, God bless America, but isn't it right for us to say, God, we bless you. Lord, we look to you. Lord, we want to return to you. When the Holy Spirit came down, Peter said, repent. Turn around. The gates of heaven are wide open to Jews. and Je Come and follow Jesus today. And so this is an appeal to God that basically says, Lord, we can't turn it around ourselves. But Lord, we're crying out to you. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we might be saved. That's in verse 3 and verse 7, verse 19. It's the chorus of this psalm. Restore us, O God. Would you say that with me, everyone? Restore us, O God. Who moved? God didn't move away. We moved away from him. And God says when we move away from him, things aren't going to go very well. So we find ourselves sat on the other side of the car. And the Lord beckons us back. Restore us, O Lord. And so the Lord says, come over here. And let me tell you how you can be restored. Let's just take the big picture again. God established the holy people. Israel compromised the covenant. They broke the covenant. Thirdly, here, Asaph, our psalmist, pleads for intervention. That's what we've been reading about. He pleads for intervention. And I would say, friends, ask God to intervene. Ask God to intervene in your life, in your family, in your community, in your state, in your nation. Lord, intervene. Make your face shine upon us. But how could this happen? How could this possibly happen? You say, Pastor, I've been thinking these thoughts. I've been feeling these things for a long, long time. We, we still seem to be in this place. I'm telling you, there's good news today. And it's found in verse 17. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. Who is this, everybody? It's got to be Jesus. The Son of Man. That's the title that Jesus took for himself. It's a humble title. It shows us that God made man. God was made man. The Son of Man that you have raised up for yourself. Let's read it again. Let your hand Rest on the man at your right hand. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Died on the cross, buried in a tomb. Three days later, rose again. Appeared to his disciples on at least nine occasions and many more. Ascended to heaven. Where is Jesus now, everyone? Heaven. At the right hand of the Father. Amen. So that your hand rests on the man. It's all about Jesus, my friends. So finally, I want to say Jesus intercedes for us. God established the covenant, Israel broke the covenant, Asaph pleased for intervention, but he does not plead in vain. God has sent Jesus to us, and by believing in Jesus, that changes everything. The answer has been simple, we moved from God. How do we get back to God? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. Wasn't that the beautiful song that we sang? It's through Christ alone that a nation can be changed. What's the great need for America? It's for people to be saved. Sometimes it's too big to even think about America. It's a huge nation, isn't it? Sometimes all you can think about is your subdivision or your school community or your business and all your, your, your friends. Well, God can use you to help others know Jesus Christ. Okay, I uh, really do need you. We're going to come to the altar in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'm praying that from the back and from the middle and the front, we can flood the altar today with, with praying for America. Amen. But I've been really agonizing over the message to bring to Wales. It's been three years since we did those big mission trips. Um, Lord, what do I say? Because, you know, the Brits get a message about America that's distorted and, and twisted by the time it kind of makes it over to the Atlantic. By the way, if there's one thing, I say to the Brits, if there's one thing worse than, than Brits misunderstanding America, it's Americans misunderstanding Britain. I mean, that's kind of the story of my life a little bit. That's just the way it goes. And so like, Lord, Lord, what are we going to say? 
And, um, you know, and, I, and so I was, I was developing this incredible apologetics talk, how to, how to lead people, because in Britain they're like minus 10, you know what I mean? In America they're like minus two these days, but like, how, do we, how do I sort of prepare a ground? And so I was really praying about this, coming up with all these brilliant thoughts. This is gonna be awesome. And uh, I had a few other folks praying for me and I just sensed, nah, that's not quite right. And I, I'll tell you what God said to me. He said this, I mean, it's as close as I could hear his voice. Just tell him about Jesus. Just tell him about Jesus. So I'm gonna talk about his birth because everyone likes Christmas, right? It's a point of reference. I'll tell him about his life. It's the greatest life that there ever was. Who is this Jesus? And I'll, I'll probably go in through C.S. Lewis stuff. He's either mad, bad, sad, Lord, liar, lunatic, or he's the son of God. I'll tell him about his death, that the beautiful son of God, born at Christmas time, lived a sinless life, never did anything wrong, died on a cross. And I'll remind them that during the Welsh revival, when Wales was the most churched culture in human history, I remind them that the message of the cross went across the nation. And I always remind them that Wales was at its best when people were preaching about the cross of Christ. People were so caught up in the emotion of Calvary that they would sometimes cry out, well, where were his friends? I'll talk about the cross. And then of course I'll talk about the resurrection, that he's alive, that he lives. So I'm gonna tell them about Jesus. And let me ask a question, do our families need to know about Jesus? Do we need to know about Jesus? Do we need to stay close to him? Does our community need to know about, and those friends, I've been challenging us today about seizing that window of opportunity. Because I tell you, I've learned in the faith that those windows that open up for a while can close again. Those doors that can be open for a while can close again. Can I just say, before hearts harden up again, we need to pray for our friends to come to know Jesus. If they miss that moment, it may never pass by again. Now, God is sovereign, I know that. No one will be lost who's not called of God, and yet at the same time, He calls us to be part of that story, amen? So I'm gonna ask us to stand together. And I'm gonna ask us to come forward, even as I'm speaking, and we're gonna sing, Lord, I need you. Remember, we need God in our life as we stand. Why don't we just pray for America? You know, the fourth weekend surely should be a a weekend when Christians rejoice that we, we do have freedom to share Christ. So why don't, we, why don't we use the freedom, amen? Let's come and pray for our land. And if there's any burden on your heart for our nation, if there's a specific thing that's on your heart, you just come and pray about that right now. Come on, come on, let's do that. Many are coming already. We would appreciate your prayers. Some of you may need to gather around Ellis, um, Louise, some who are on the mission trip. Um, please just come and gather around them, lay a hand on them, and pray for them, because Ellis has got a big, he's got increased responsibility in Wales these, these days as he uh, works with Zeke and all the music and all that's going on. We bless Ellis and Kerry. Thank you for praying for Louise, leading the, what we call the CAT team, the community action team. Uh, our mission trip's going well. I got a text from Al this morning in St. John's Island, by the way, and uh, a really key young person has been saved that has brought great joy to the, to the whole church. And would some more come and just pray for many salvations. Let's pray for a lot of people to be saved in this day. Uh, maybe there's one person that needs to come forward and say, God, I hear the thing about inviting people about Jesus. Maybe there's someone here you've never led anyone to Christ before. I'd love this to be the year when you can say, wow, I actually led someone to Christ. Wouldn't that be awesome? C come, come walk forward, ask for special power in your life, gospel power in your life. So lead us now, Sister Heidi, the rest of us, we're gonna pray together, ask God to move in our midst.